AP Biology, Second Quarter Review, Part 3. Cell Membrane Permeability. Permeability means allowing stuff through. So we can describe the cell membrane as semi-permeable. The prefix semi means half or partial. Permeable means allowing stuff through. Some things can get through, some things can't. And you should know what things can and can't get through. Now carbohydrates are too big uh, and they're hydrophilic. They won't make it past those fatty acid tails in the phospholipid bilayer. Proteins are also too big and many have hydrophilic R groups. Lipids can get through uh, because they're hydrophobic. The fatty acid table tails don't stop them and they can get past those uh, phosphate heads. Nucleic acids are really big and uh, they're hydrophilic with all the nitrogen in there. Water can get through. Now you know water is polar and it's hydrophob uh, hydrophilic. However, uh, it's small. It's only 201 oxygen and it is able to s squeak by those phospholipids in the phospholipid bilayer. However, it only moves through slowly. In order to move large quantities of water, we need the special protein holes called aquaporins. So what gets through? Well, only lipid soluble molecules and small molecules like gases, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. Here's a transport summary. This is the inside of the cell over here in, in uh, tan. The blue represents the interstitial fluid close to the bloodstream. So we're talking how we get stuff into the cell. This is all chapter eight stuff. Diffusion, remember, does not require energy by the cell. It is a natural process as a result of the kinetic energy of particles going from just randomly moving around from concentrated to less concentrated, going from high concentration to low concentration, going down a concentration gradient is another way of describing this from where it's concentrated to less concentrated. This is called diffusion, and only really small molecules like gases and fats and oils, nonpolar molecules, can go right across the cell membrane by diffusion. So what if you're hydrophobic, or, or hydrophilic rather, or really large? Well, you're going to need some help, help from a protein channel. The purple here represents a protein channel, and uh, this one is um, going to allow things, bigger things like glucose, sugar, C6H1206, 24 uh, atom molecule, to uh, move in from high to low concentration. If you require the help of a protein channel, we call that facilitated, and if it's high to low diffusion. These are both types of passive transport, or transport that does not require any energy by the cell. Now for uh, insulin, uh, if you remember, insulin opens up this protein channel so the glucose can get into the cell. And if you don't make insulin, if you're a type 1 diabetic, then this protein channel doesn't open up, you don't get the sugar in your cell, the sugar stays in your blood, so you're hyperglycemic no sugar in the cell, so you can't do cell respiration, you don't make ATP, you're tired all the time, eventually the cells can die and you have amputation. So, you know, understand that there's a lot of significance to understanding this stuff. And it's not just diabetes, but we're just using that as an example of connecting the uh, academic to uh, health things. Over here, our last step here is uh, going from low to high concentration. Think of it as the opposite of diffusion. And, uh, you know, if you, the um, example we used in class is like putting a drop of dye in water. Imagine if you, after the dye had spread out throughout the water for diffusion, then you had to reconcentrate that dye. Well, you'd have to boil off the water, that would require energy. And um, to concentrate anything, that's going to require energy. And that uh, energy is going to be coming from the cell in the form of ATP. So active transport is used for things like ions, for example, potassium and sodium ions. Uh, we'll talk more about that when we talk about the nervous system and how that functions. But um, basically going from low to high concentration is called active transport, and that requires energy and a protein channel. Gated channels only open up with a signal. We'll talk more about that with the nervous system. Uh, we have vaulted gated channels that only open up in the uh, presence of volts uh, or gates that open only open up in the presence of charges. Here's a good Venn diagram kind of summarizing all this stuff. We have a triple Venn here, diffusion, facilitated diffusion, where they overlap as things they have in common. They all share in common, transport across the cell membrane. All right, so what about really big molecules that can't even move through a protein channel? Well, we have three types of inside cell transport. Endo means inside, cytomine means cell. And if you know these word parts, your, your life is a lot easier. The prefix phago means to eat, and uh, phagocytosis is basically cell eating, and basically engulfing food particles that can be digested with enzymes inside. Pino refers to water, so pinocytosis is cell drinking, where the water is taken in into a little vacuole and then um, taken inside the cell. We also have another endocytosis called receptor-mediated endocytosis, where these little cell receptors uh, will trigger the uh, the uh, engulfing of things. All right, so 
this is what the cell membrane kind of uh, looks like in a visualized uh, sense. What we have here is a cell membrane, and most of the cell membrane is made of phospholipid bilayer. Uh, we have a term used to describe this this uh, cell membrane. It kind of acts like a soap bubble, where things are not really fixed in place unless they're held by cytoskeleton structures. Things can slide past each other. We can pinch off little bubbles of membrane and make little vesicles and vacuoles inside. Because things can kind of fluidly slide past each other, we have a name for that. It is called the fluid mosaic, M-O-S-A-I-C, model of describing the cell membrane. And it's just basically meaning that things can slide past each other like a soap bubble. It's not solid like a plastic bag. Here we have integral proteins. Remember, we have uh, proteins that can be used for protein channels that are not shown here uh, for facilitated diffusion and active transport. We have uh, these little carbohydrate side chains. You can see the little glucose coming off here for cell-cell recognition. This will be the things that determine like a, a uh, blood type from a B blood type, or if you get a tissue transplant, these are the things that can cause problems as far as rejection. And if your glycoproteins are similar to your family's, then maybe you can get an organ from them. And that's what we're talking about here. Uh, glycoprotein is what we call these things. Glyco means sugar, protein is the protein part, and these are used for cell cell recognition. Over here we have our cholesterol. Cholesterol, remember, is a type of lipid, it's a source molecule for the sex hormones. However, uh, it's also used to maintain the membrane fluidity in animal cells. Plant cells don't have it, but animal cells do. So that's another component you should know that's part of the cell membrane. All right, concentration of water. Remember, hyper means above. Tonic refers to the solutes. So hypertonic means above solutes. If you ever forget that, remember hyperactive means you're above activity. Hypo is the opposite of hyper, and you know you just go from there. So hypertonic, more dissolved stuff, which means less water. Hypotonic means less dissolved stuff. Hypo means under, like a hypodermic needle. Uh, that means under the skin. Hypotonic, less solute, which means it's more water. The most hypotonic solution you can have is pure water, distilled water. And then we have isotonic, which have equal solute concentrations on both sides. And these are terms used to describe the water in comparison to some other water separated by some kind of barrier, like a cell membrane. Now here we have a membrane, we got water. Uh, going from where it's more pure to less pure, from hypotonic, less dissolved stuff, that means the water's more concentrated, to where it's less concentrated by diffusion of water called osmosis. Now, keep in mind, the water is actually going both directions. However, more water is going from hypo to hyper than the other direction. If this uh, yellow representing some kind of solute can move through the cell membrane, it's going to go down its concentration gradient from high to low. So water would go one way, the solute would go the other way. This is the net movement of water, so that means it's going both directions, just more is going from high to low. So it, how does that uh, affect cells? Well, if a cell is placed in a hypotonic solution compared to the cell water inside, that means the water outside the cell, hypo, under, tonic, solutes, less solutes, more pure water, the water goes from more pure to less pure by osmosis, increases the mass uh, size of the cell, and eventually the cell bursts. Now remember, things like freshwater organisms have a contractile vacuole to prevent them from lysing or breaking their cell membrane. Plant cells have a cell wall, so they don't burst. They become turgid or rigid, and plants do well in fresh uh, hypotonic solutions that allows them to stand upright. That turgor, by the way, is one reason why the plants don't fall over. Cell walls is another reason. And for things like trees, they have a third reason called lignin, which is the woody part of trees. Isotonic solution that has equal concentrations of water on both sides. Your blood is isotonic to your blood cells, otherwise they burst or shrink. And the water moves in and out equally, so the cell size stays, stays the same. IVs at a hospital are isotonic to your cells, otherwise you'd have some real problems getting that IV. Plant cells, when put in an isotonic solution, have equal amounts of water. They start to wilt a little bit, and that's called flaccid. So uh, they, they actually do better in, in hypotonic solutions. Don't salt your plants. Hypertonic solution, we have a salty solution, or a high solute concentration. It doesn't have to be salt, it could be sugar or anything else. And when you uh, place cells in a hypertonic solution, where there's more solutes compared to the cell, the water is less pure. The water goes from where it's more pure in the cell, the cell water would be called hypotonic to less pure outside, and the cell water uh, leaves and the cell shrinks and eventually dies. That's why you don't drink that salt water in the ocean. Don't do it. 
And then we have plasmolysis. What happens in plant cells is the water leaves the inside cytoplasm and uh, the cell membrane right here kind of pulls away from the cell wall. And as that cell loses its cytoplasm, we have a word for that called plasmolysis. Now remember uh, water potential, we're talking about you know going from higher water potential to lower water potential or hypotonic to hypertonic. And the highest water potential can have is zero for solute potential. All right, remember contractile vacuoles, they squeeze out that extra water in freshwater organisms because they live in hypotonic freshwater. Water enters their cells by osmosis. All right, so the cell located right here, you know, in parentheses or quotation marks, and then the beaker water, we have 0 0.05 molar solution inside the cell. So that has more solutes compared to the outside water. So the cell water is hypertonic compared to the beaker water. The beaker water has less dissolved solutes, so it's hypotonic compared to the cell water. And the water is going to go from where it's more pure, hypotonic to hypertonic. Water potential is used to predict the movement of water by osmosis. Water potential consists of two parts, pressure potential, which you don't have to know for this class, and solute water potential, which you do have to know. Pure water has the water potential of zero, has no solutes in it. And solutes decrease water potential as it becomes more hypertonic, it, um, it lower, the water potential number goes down. And we had a calculation for that in one of our labs. So if we had a water potential, uh, solution A has a water potential of minus 0.3, and then we have solution B with minus 0.1. Whatever's closer to zero is going to have a higher water potential and it's going to be closer to pure water. If you remember that zero is pure water and you just go down from there, that helps you kind of figure out what's going on. We made a little you know, arrow for that as well. So the water is more pure in the minus 0.1 solution because that's closer to zero and that means it has less solutes in it and it's going to go from where it's, the water's going to move from where it's more pure to less pure higher water potential to lower water potential, hypotonic to hypertonic. And that's what we use water potential for. Cell respiration and photosynthesis, some of the more complicated topics of the second quarter and all of the whole year for that matter. So remember why we're doing this. Glucose is a uh, model. Now the other things can enter uh, the mitochondria, but they have to be modified first. Uh, we're catabolizing or breaking apart glucose to make our ATP energy. And here's the general formula. We have glucose, C6H12O6, one molecule, plus six oxygen molecules, yields six carbon dioxide molecules, six water molecules, and ATP energy. And also heat is going to be a waste product of that as well. Now, when we just burn a log, do we release that energy right away? Think of cell respiration as burning the sugar, but at a much lower temperature, in many, many small steps, releasing the energy to make ATP. But we're still going to be breaking it down and making carbon dioxide and water. Uh, so it's kind of like a controlled burn, if you want to think of it that way. Catalyzed by enzymes, types of proteins that carry out chemical reactions. So what's the deal with ATP? Well, ADP is a uh, like an uncharged battery. These phosphates are held very stable to the adenosine part of this molecule and uh, they can't transfer the energy to other molecules very easily. That's why it's like a, it's not very good for using it for energy. However, the mitochondria, the main job of that mitochondria is adding a phosphate to ADP to make ATP in a process called phosphorylation. Once we add that phosphate, that uh, phosphate to the ADP, now it has three phosphates and now it's called ATP. And this last phosphate is not held on very strong at all. It's very reactive. You can't, you can't store ATP. You can store sugar, but you can't store that ATP. It's too reactive. And uh, the good thing about that is that you can transfer the energy associated with it to destabilize another molecule to allow another chem chemical reaction to take place. That's chemistry, folks. And um, as far as this uh, ATP, ATP molecule, it has stored energy. It has a little bit of energy. Uh, between those phosphates, between the second and third, and you can kind of think of it as a charged battery. So what is that mitochondria doing in cell respiration? You're making charged batteries of ATP to carry out life processes like keeping your lungs breathing and your muscles moving and all that good stuff. Oxidation and reduction. Oxidation, think of it as adding oxygen, and it's the reverse for hydrogen. So if you remember oxidation is adding oxygen, just think it's the opposite for the hydrogen, removing the hydrogen. And a hydrogen is just one electron and one proton. So if you remove a hydrogen, you remove the electron and proton. It's like the loss of electrons. It's a release of energy, and it's always extragonic or energy releasing. We also have reduction. 
Think of it as reducing the number of oxygen and the reverse of hydrogen, or adding hydrogen. Hydrogen is one electron and one proton, so if you add a hydrogen, you're adding electrons with the proton. And this is a storing energy process. It's energonic. So if you take a look here, we have sugar losing all of its hydrogen, oxidation, to become carbon dioxide. That's what, the, what happens to it. Sugar becomes oxidized. Oxygen becomes reduced to add hydrogens to form water. And this ends part three.